Welcome to a Fresh Story podcast. This season, we're digging into all things divorce. We'll be discussing the ins, the outs, the nitty gritty, all that stuff we don't talk about. Well, we're going to talk about it. Join us for everything you've always wanted to know about divorce, but we're afraid to ask. Remember, you're not alone. Let's dive into divorce together. Olivia here. Did you know that there's approximately 700,000 people a year who transition to divorce? And these are all people who get up in the morning, have their coffee, go to work, deal with bosses, clients, and coworkers all day, all while going through the process of divorce, which in itself is a full-time job. So how does your divorce impact your workplace wellness? How do people manage to balance their divorce and a full-time job? How do you talk about your divorce at work? What if you need to take time off for a custody issue or to talk to your lawyer? What if you just simply need to cry at your desk? Well, on this episode of A Fresh Story, The Divorce Season, we're covering everything you always wanted to know concerning workplace wellness, your career, human resources, and the divorce experience. Some of the questions covered in this episode include, how can I balance the demands of my job with the emotional stress of going through a divorce? How do I handle disclosing my divorce to my employer and my coworkers? Can I negotiate changes to my work schedule or location to accommodate my new family arrangements? What if I need to find a new job during my divorce process? How can I update my resume? And how can a career coach help me through my divorce process? The Fresh Starts experts you will hear featured in this episode include Kara Regis, a burnout and boundaries coach, Arasan Nicole, founder of Authentic Empowerment, career and resume coach, Nikki Innocent, founder of the Inclusive Leadership Collective. She's a holistic coach for career, life, and interpersonal change. Anne Runkel, founder of Forward with Anne. She's a divorce and career coach. And Tramel D. Jones, founder of TDJ Consulting and Career Services. She's a career and resume coach. Remember, you can find more info on divorceguide.co, divorcemonth.com, and get in touch with all of these experts on freshstartsregistry.com slash experts. Don't forget, you're not alone in this process. We're all here for you. So let's get started. So my name's Tramel D. Jones. I am a strategic success and workplace wellness coach. We have a question here for you. So, hi, Fresh Starts. I'm in the middle of my divorce and I'm building my hype team, which we love. I was just wondering, how can a career coach help me through my divorce process? That's such a good question. I think sometimes the just concept of a career coach almost seems like a luxury, right? Or people aren't really clear on how that person can help you because most of us come from the old school of you just walk into some place, ask if they're hiring, and you get a job. But unfortunately, you know, things have changed so much so that things are much more complex. And so a career coach can help you in a couple of ways. The first is probably going to be my favorite thing in the whole wide world, and it's career planning. Now, Specific to my friends who are just coming out from a a divorce, what I would say is we need to do some career transition planning. And people do not have to be scared. I am not going to come to you and be like, okay, listen, you need to be making a million dollars an hour tomorrow, right? I think sometimes people are under the impression that when they come to a career coach, I'm going to push you to be in this very upper echelon hierarchy of work. That's not the case. Um, career planning and career transition planning is all about finding what works for you and your current situation and the parameters that your life has, right? So if that means that we're looking for part-time work, I'm happy to do this. So with career planning, this is really all about making sure 
that we just identify again what your strengths are um i want to create a resume that's going to really be your hype man on paper right i believe career i mean i believe your resume should be your stunt double it goes ahead of you it does all the work for you you just show up to collect your prize via the interview but if you haven't taken the time to really think about where your skills lie how there is value in your past what life experience can transition into transferable skills it's going to be hard to do those types of things by yourself. So a career expert can help you put that on paper and make sure that the language is connected to what people are saying in the industry now, especially if you've been out of the loop for a bit, right? So obviously with that resume, we also want to make sure that you have an online presence that is just as impactful. So I love helping my clients not just create a LinkedIn profile. It's not just making it pretty. There are a lot of back office things to where you can actually make that LinkedIn profile work for you and you can have recruiters contacting you for positions. But if you're not quite sure on what or where to do that on the LinkedIn profile, you just putting a picture up saying that you're interested in working is not enough, right? So that's another thing that a career planning expert like myself can help you do. But a couple of other things. Emotional intelligence in the workplace is another reason, right? I want to make sure that you understand how to manage your stress at work, how to communicate effectively with both your colleagues and your bosses. I want you to understand how to maintain focus on your professional responsibilities while at work and not take that stuff home, right? And so a lot of times there's um, work-life balance also, right? There's a lot of boundaries that you've got to set very early. If you go into the workplace, wanting to be the workhorse. Oh, I feel like I need to prove that I'm a good worker. So give me anything, give me everything. You will go to hell quickly. I don't want that for anybody. So I want to teach you how to manage your workload effectively, set workplace boundaries and prioritize your self-care in the workplace. Um, That's the second part of what I do. It's all about that workplace wellness. And this sometimes comes after the fact but it's much easier to set these boundaries on day one than it is for somebody to have already kind of taken up your life and you try to pull back from that. Another thing that a career coach can help you with is networking and support systems. I always am thinking, who can I introduce my clients to? Um, I work with a lot of people. I've been doing this quite a, a few years. So when I hear people, my mind just starts going, oh, I think I can introduce this person to this person. They'd be a good connection, right? So um, remember, you're tapping into people, um, not just for themselves, you're really tapping into them as a door, opening up to a world of networking and connections. So you want to make sure that you utilize that person who, huh, I hope that I would be your career coach, right? But your career coach is also going to help you connect with other people. And then um, another thing, is refining your resume. I think it's very easy to just put stuff on paper, but I want to make sure that you don't just throw words on paper. I want that paper to represent you extremely well. Um, again, I see your resume as your stunt double. It goes ahead of you. It does all the hard work, the heavy lifting for you, and then you show up and collect your prize in the interview. Um, but if your resume hasn't been um, professionally optimized, you might not even realize that are, there are things you're doing, there are things you're saying on that resume that are kicking you out before a human even sees it. I love all of that. And I was going to say too, I mean, just having worked with you and knowing how extremely empathetic and supportive you are, I would imagine for somebody who's going through any big life transition and divorce especially, um, having a career coach just to be your hype person is yeah. is such a huge asset to the next phase of your life. I should add to this, and I, you know, I actually should add to all of my marketing materials. Like I don't say this enough. It's probably the one hidden component that is the most impactful. I'm really a confidence coach. I have a lot of um, feedback from clients that says, you know, above everything, you help me with my confidence, and that's what I want to do for all of my clients, right? So I do have a lot of uh, people who've come to me, maybe they're in a transition and they're trying to figure out what's next. And for some reason, they don't see their experience as as valuable 
as they should. And so I really am there to say, listen, you know, I've done the research and I'm looking at what you have to offer and I'm not going to just tell you anything to just tell you, but for real, you've got so much value and you've got something that you can bargain with here, right? So I think hearing that from a professional is super helpful for people. Yeah. Yeah. One of the biggest things I do is confidence building. Yeah. And imagine hearing that from you while you're going through a divorce, it could change really the trajectory of the next phase of your your life. I mean, having that support there. Well, that is amazing advice. And if anybody wants to work with Tramel, you can go to Fresh Starts and find her over there. I have worked with her many times and she is an amazing person. So uh, brilliant. And we adore her. Thank you so much, Tramel. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to see how this all goes. I'm Ann Runkle, and I am a certified divorce coach and certified career coach, helping you do hard things like navigating divorce or making a career change, sometimes both, uh, with clarity and confidence. Okay, mm-hmm. Ann, we have a question for you. So it goes like this. We get this question a lot because, as we know, divorce begets a lot of other changes in life. Um, Hi, Fresh Starts. I'm considering a divorce, but one of the questions that keeps making me nervous is what if I have to find a new job during my divorce process? How can I update my resume and look for a new job during this incredibly difficult time? What do you say, Anne? Oh, I say anything is possible during divorce in a sense. Um, Everyone's individual situation is so vastly different that I, of course, always have like a verbal asterisk, if you will, next to any of my answers publicly that, it, you know, what I'm sharing, we need to, of course, always dig more deeply into your personal situation, consider legal ramifications, depending on um, your, your, your local jurisdiction, the conflict level within a potential divorce, et cetera. But that being said, anything is possible. Um, I can speak personally. I was working part-time when I filed for divorce and needed to very quickly begin working full-time. So I made that change very quickly. Um, Many people that I have worked with or that I personally know have needed to make for various reasons, a change to their career, their employment uh, during divorce. It is entirely possible. It is tricky as most things are during divorce as well. So one of the things I say most often is just like every marriage, every divorce is different and every job search is different. So when you combine job search with divorce, it is going to be a little tricky for you and that's okay. That's what I'm here for. So when you are considering making a job change while going through a divorce, you'll want to approach the process with a different framework than you might if you were looking for a job still married or perhaps post-divorce. So the things I want you to think about. So you want to think about what life will look like after the divorce. Where will you be living? What kind of commute might you have from your new home to wherever a new job might be located? What hours will you have available to work once you are the only adult in the house during your parenting time with your children? What kind of changes to childcare might you need to make in order to juggle work and parenthood? Are you able to travel either because they're, you know, your children are with you part of the time um, or is travel off the table because of being a single parent with primary custody? Uh, Are you interested in and able to find a virtual position or is your expertise in something that will be in person? Um, What kind of salary or income threshold do you need to meet? What might your new rent or new mortgage obligation be post-divorce? What other expenses do you need to budget for that you didn't have to previously? Will you be receiving or paying child support or maintenance to or from the other parent? How does that impact you financially? What additional benefits do you need from a job, such as flexible paid time off, insurance benefits, or retirement benefits? Are you able to consider contract work or kind of gig, quote unquote gig positions? Or are you really needing to focus on a full-time W-2 position within an organization? There are so many variables to consider that it can feel overwhelming, which is why someone like myself is a divorce coach. I help reduce the overwhelm 
when you're thinking about making such a major life change on either front. Some people find that when they're going through a divorce, they need to find a short-term solution just to get by until the chaos of the divorce is done. And therefore they seek a good enough for now job. Once they emerge on the other side of the storm with more clarity around what their new life looks like, they reapproach the job search with more mindfulness and intentionality. Um, others are, are able to find that job, that dream job, if you will, or the right job that fits their needs, their interests, and their budget, and they end up staying long after the divorce is done. There are also people that struggle with focus and attention at their current job while going through a divorce. And despite the fear of losing their job, they find support and understanding from their supervisor or their boss, and they end up thriving post-divorce without ever having to make a change. One of the hardest parts of divorce is that you really can't see clearly through to the other side until you're there. And so I encourage my clients to stay flexible with where they're headed, but stay firm in their mindset and continue to take action steps, even within that sense of overwhelm, meaning remain hopeful and optimistic that you're on the right path, but understand that the path may take you in a direction you never would have considered before. No one is the same person on the other side of divorce. You may find that your values and your priorities have changed. You may be stronger and more clear-headed than you were when you were stuck in a crumbling marriage. You may find that your circumstances require something vastly different from your career than it did before. Or you may find your job is the one thing that doesn't change amidst a million other things that do. That do. No matter what, you've got to keep your eyes forward and keep putting one foot in front of the other. As far as updating your resume goes, oh my goodness, there are so many ways to do that these days. You can find guides and templates galore online for free. Quick Google search. I promise you, you'll find some. If you don't, if you can't, just hit me up. I'll help you. I'll point you in the right direction. You can also utilize AI these days. Although my biggest tip there, use AI sparingly and make sure that no matter what you do, the end product of your resume reflects your true voice, your true accomplishments, and your true self just maybe enhanced a little bit. You can also hire a resume writer. You can utilize a career coach to give you feedback on your existing resume. The most important thing is to just get working on it. You wanna seek help, Google, search for free resources, especially when you're going through a divorce, budget is often tighter than normal. Um, there are so many free opportunities out there. Um, you definitely wanna to try to find what can it fit within your budget to help you with this really important decision-making process. And then you got to start networking. You got to tell people you're looking for a job. You've got to tell them what you're looking for or what you're not looking for. You may not really know what your end goal is, but you know what you don't want. Get talking. Get talking with people. Talk to as many people as possible who can maybe connect you with the next best person to get you just one step closer to your desired outcome. I cannot emphasize enough. Good old fashioned networking, connecting and talking with people can help tremendously with your job search. That being said, no one is their best self when you're going through a divorce. So feeling comfortable enough and confident enough to network or interview can be really tricky. So identify your best support team of friends and family, lean on them for feedback, confident, confidence boosts, and help as you prepare for interviews, networking phone calls, virtual coffee dates, etc. And keep reminding yourself that no matter what, you will figure this out. You will find the right position, even if it's only right for right now, you will find the right position and you'll figure out the next steps after the dust settles post-divorce. Amazing. And I want to highlight you for a second, Anne, because you are a divorce coach and a career coach. So you are at that intersection that I we find like probably 50% of the people going through divorce need you for that reason. So can you just talk for a second? Because everybody listening, a lot of people listening to this will either be going through a divorce or know somebody going through a divorce or will eventually go through a divorce. Um, how How is the work you do slightly different in terms of maybe divorce coaching and career coaching, both and? Because you're certified in both. And so you can, can really support people. So I'd love for you just to really brag about yourself for a second and talk about the work you do. Um, because I've seen it firsthand. I know how wonderful you are and how wonderful it is to work with you, but it's a very unique intersection that you work with people at. And so I'd love to hear how you hold that space for them. Absolutely. I, I feel so 
blessed, if you will, uh, to do the work that I do. Um, you know, your marital status and your career um, are two of the biggest aspects of your identity, biggest aspects of your day to day life, um, and two of the biggest things that change when you're going through divorce. And and divorce is a major life change. Um, I do so. I do career coaching both within my divorce coaching because of, as you said, a huge percentage of people, both male and female, although often it is skewed a little bit more to, to the, 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 the female, um, aspects of the divorce experience some sort of change when it comes to their career, either needing to make changes to their schedules, needing to find something more flexible, needing to relocate higher budget, et cetera, or they are struggling so immensely at work because of the focus that divorce takes up the amount of space in your brain, in your energy, in your nervous system that is occupied by divorce when going through it is really impactful in a negative way on your work or your business. If you're a business owner. So being certified in both divorce and career coaching, I can help at minimum keep my clients more focused so that they are able to show up at work as a slightly better version of themselves in order to keep the wheels on the wagon, right? I do not want you to lose your job or lose clients if you're a business owner because of that distraction that comes with divorce. So I try to keep you focused and rooted in action mode instead of that analysis paralysis, let's tackle it head on and let's get you going so you can remain focused on what you're doing at work so you can also get your divorce obligations taken care of. Related to that, though, is sometimes job changes happen. Um, I spent 20 years in the corporate world helping people grow in their own careers, um, navigating change, and I feel so strongly in helping people find the right job. Um, I had mentioned earlier, I've been laid off twice in my professional career. That changes you. You do not, just like you don't emerge the same person through divorce, you don't emerge the same person after you've been laid off. And I, you know, there's plenty of stories and backgrounds there as to what happened, but it happens to a lot of people and it will forever change you. So when that happens, it is such a life altering experience. And we get lost in the emotional aspects. We get lost in the overwhelm. We get lost in the analysis paralysis. So as a coach, as a divorce, I'm sorry, career coach, I'm going to help cut through that noise, cut through that overwhelm. And we focus on action. There's a lot we can't control. There's a lot we can do. So how can I help you take those action steps when you really don't feel like doing it. Um, but you've got to get back to work. Yeah. You've got to find the next best step. So um, there's so much of that intersection within divorce. And then just separately unrelated to divorce, our careers, our business um, is such a big part of our livelihood, financially, yeah. emotionally, mentally, all of that, that when that change happens, um, I want to help you get through it um, yeah. as best as you possibly can. Yeah, and how how um, amazing it is to – this is what we're all about, right? But if you can support people going through these life changes and, and reframe their narratives and help really empower them, it completely changes the rest of their life. I mean, you know, going from this, like – you know, culturally divorced job changes are seen as negative and, you know, disempowering and a setback. And we're here mixing it up and saying, no, actually, right. It's actually yeah. this beautiful time. You're in this chrysalis, you get to bloom and, and we're here to support you. So if anybody's yeah. listening and is in this intersection and would love the support, we cannot recommend Anne enough. She's just a wonderful person. And, and thank you for all the wisdom and um, people can definitely check you out. I know you are always offering some great tips and guidance on your social media. So thank you for being here. I am here. here to help however I can. Hi, I'm Tara Regas. I'm a certified life coach and I help people struggling with burnout to set healthy limits to restore their energy. Okay, Kara, we have a reader question here for you today. It says, hey, Fresh Starts, I'm in the middle of my divorce process and I feel totally depleted in all areas of my life. How can I balance the demands of my job with the emotional stress of going through a divorce? What do you say to that one, Kara? Okay, well, I gave this question quite a lot of thought and I feel it's really necessary to address the root cause underneath the question. And I see the root cause here as an energy crisis. So my answer to this is to tend to that energy crisis. And that means dealing with your, not just your physical energy, but 
your emotional and your mental energy in all the ways. So for me, the way that I would help people with this in real time would be to look at how they are uh, managing their thoughts, specifically their worries and how that turns into self-judgment and self-criticism. And then the next step here is to add in some self-compassion, kind thoughts to ourselves, reframing, that kind of thing. And then finally, we look at what are the needs that are not being met in your life and how you can actually set boundaries in different ways to get those needs met. So I know that's a roundabout answer to the question, but this, from my perspective, is the best way to handle this sort of uh, energy crisis that comes when we're looking at how do I handle all of this at once. Yeah, that makes sense. So what are some like just quick actionable tips that people could do to disconnect from the chaos right of what they're going through mm -hmm. and just kind of like start filling that energy bucket up again right so i mean it comes back to really understanding what's missing uh, and that can be what there isn't enough of and also what there's too much of right because anytime yeah. we're feeling overwhelmed it's usually because there's an imbalance in both of those directions and um, from my perspective, the best way to figure that out is to listen to your, uh, your thoughts, your feelings in different interactions, especially around different people and specific situations. So, you know, for example, let's say I'm around a particular person in my life and I walk away feeling really drained or strained maybe in some way or jacked up. Uh, maybe that person brings a lot of drama into my life, for example. And unless I'm already dealing with a divorce, I don't need this. I don't need this extra energy drain. So that's a really good example of when I would uh, step in for myself or with a client and look at what are the limits that I can set with that person in terms of how I speak with, with them about whatever so that I'm protecting my mental and emotional energy when it comes to how much I'm giving. Yeah, I love that. And so what would be the benefit if you're going through a divorce and you're listening to this of working with somebody like you, who your job is to help people set boundaries, which is really hard to do, especially during a divorce. So how would you work with somebody to help them, especially at work, right? Because we yeah. show up to work and we're so depleted from the emotional uh, you know, capacity that we're putting into the divorce. So how would you as a boundaries coach work with somebody to start, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know, helping them set those boundaries in all those ways. Yeah. Well, I mean, so we can talk about work and, you know, home life as two separate spheres, but especially when you're dealing with a huge transition like divorce, you know, anybody who's gone through it knows it, it touches you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's never a time that that's not with you. So I don't think that that kind of compartmentalization is really helpful uh, we can't see ourselves as turning that sort of aspect of our lives on and off when we enter and exit work. So I prefer to to work with people more on a holistic sense, taking the whole person with them everywhere they go, recognizing that they maybe don't have the same, same standards at work that they normally do and that that's normal. Like, let's think about the expectations right. that we have for ourselves, right? To just yeah. power through. We live in a culture where it's all just about pushing through and pretending everything's fine. And and that's not helpful, right? So we have to be, be real about that. And it might mean cutting back. It might mean waiting until a year from now to go for that promotion instead of this year, right? It might mean looking at the boundaries that I need to set around other people's access to me. Um, maybe it means taking on fewer larger scale projects, it's usually going to mean cutting back. And that's because if you don't, you're going to end up burned out in a year anyway. <laughs> and sometimes you just yeah. need permission, right? Sometimes you just need mm -hmm. permission. So yeah. what would you say if you're going through a divorce? And there's, um, we talk about this a lot, but so little support in the workspace for people going through a divorce. It's non-existent, really. Yeah. Something we're working hard to change at Fresh Starts. Mm -hmm. So if you're going through a divorce and you show up for work and your colleagues are like, what's happening with you? What's going on? Like, mm -hmm. what's just like a really easy way you can respond to people to kind of like hold your space and say, like, I don't want to talk about this, but this is something going on in my life. Yeah. And that's really tricky because um, 
it, de- it really depends on who you're speaking to as well, like how much you're willing to divulge and also, you know, how much you want to get into that headspace while you're trying to focus on another work stuff. And I think you already halfway answered the question. And the first thing is just awareness here. Uh, do I have a tendency to kind of word vomit in this moment, right? If I'm feeling extra, extra <laughs> that morning or something came up, you know, I just had a text with my ex in the morning and I'm feeling triggered and I show up at the office, right? Just to be aware of where I am right now before going to those conversations or as you're going into those conversations, tending to yourself and really just noticing what's here and how much is it really valuable for me to share right now? How can I protect myself right now? It's That's easy to question. overshare. Yeah, I love that question. How mu- What did you say? How much is it valuable for me? What, what it was that? I love that question. How much... Is it valuable for me to share right now? Yeah, I love that. Because that's the thing. I think especially those of us socialized as women, we have this knee-jerk reaction that we have to respond to everything that people ask us. Like we're not allowed to just say, uh, sorry, but I don't want to talk about that, right? Right. So just recognizing that that is an option or just being general is an option. We Mm -hmm. don't have to go into it. We don't have to dig and divulge the way that maybe we would assume that we have to. Yeah, and lo- people love to talk about divorce, right? So they love to, to get the de- the dirty details. And so I would recommend if you are going through divorce, working with somebody like Kara here, uh, you know, even for just a few sessions, right, to learn the language of boundaries, right, and to mm-hmm. get the permission to speak up and say, I can't attend this meeting right now, point blank, right? You don't need to get into it, right, because of a custody issue or because of that. Um, yeah. Do you have anything else, any wise words you'd like to share about setting boundaries, especially in the workspace uh, for people going through mm. divorce? Well, I mean, it, when we talk about setting boundaries in the workspace, I understand that there is a lot of privilege in me just saying that you can set boundaries at all in the workspace. I understand that this is tied to people's uh, basic you know, needs to, to exist in the world. Um, and, and that said, that there usually are ways to gently but firmly uh, say no in select places, as long as you're not doing it across the board. Uh, usually it's a sign of professionalism, not a sign of somebody being lazy or not caring about their work. So if you frame it in that way of, I'm trying to do a really good job here, the way I can do a good job is by limiting this thing, for example, or only keeping my scope up to this point, for example. I love that reframe. I think that's a really powerful reframe to have. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kara. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Aris Ann, and I am a career and confidence coach that helps women pivot with purpose. Okay, here's our question for you today. Somebody wrote in and said, hey there, I'm in the middle of a divorce, and I'm nervous about talking about my divorce at work. How do I handle disclosing my divorce to my employer or my coworkers? What do you say on this one? I think it's a wonderful question. There are two sides, I would say, to disclosing to employers and coworkers. But first and foremost, it's really important to remember you get to decide how much and when you disclose to your employers and coworkers. So one side of it is... First, understanding, for example, health care, finances, any sort of benefits that you and your spouse were on together. If those need to be separated, if you are going to be on their health plan for a while, if they're going to be on your health plan, plan for a while, if you have kids and the health care is there. And that is really important to know because with the IRS, you have you don't have to wait till open enrollment to get on a new health care. You have 60 days when an event like divorce separation happens. And so that's where I say the first thing, go to HR and talk to them about what you need to do. And remember that HR is confidential. And so you can go as a first step to make sure you feel like you have your business in order and you're feeling confident with healthcare, finances, whatever it is. And if you especially work for a larger company, there are benefits that are often not talked about and shared that help folks through divorce or separation. So check to see if there's resources. Sometimes it may be free legal resources. Sometimes it may be free therapy. Just check with HR because I always say there's a lot of hidden benefits folks don't know that are available to them. 
So that's the admin, get your stuff in order so you make sure that you have health care and your finances feel secure. And then on the other side, when it comes to disclosing to coworkers, team, this is more when I say you get to decide on what level you feel comfortable. I always recommend, hopefully, you have a good relationship with your manager. That is always a good first step so that one, if you are have to go to court dates for some whatever reason, you can't show up to work or you'll have unexpected pick up kids that they're aware so they can help support you where it's needed or maybe workload needs to be adjusted by talking and having that conversation with your manager as soon as you are able that's going to help them support you so you don't feel like you're trying to do it all and no one knows about it. Though, if you don't have a supportive manager, this is where I recommend going to your HR representative and sharing with them and asking them for their advice to how to approach it with the manager, knowing that you might not have a supportive manager. Because again, it's confidential and they might be able to help you. Or if your manager is not being supportive, they can help support you uh, and keep records and track if your manager is, is being a bad manager. And then when it comes to sharing with your coworkers, again, you get to decide what comfort level. Some folks maybe want their manager to share to the team and have them say, hey, so-and-so is going through a divorce. Please don't bring this up. I'm sharing. We're sharing this with you because she wanted you to know, and this is not something that they want to discuss. That is completely okay. Maybe you want to tell coworkers one-on-one. Again, at the end of the day, it's you deciding what level of comfort you have and want to share because you are not obligated to share your business with your coworkers. That is all such good advice. I want to go back to the beginning of what you said. So I remember when going through my divorce, the scariest thing was getting off the health insurance plan. And we were under my ex-husband's. I remember sitting down at the dining room table to figure out my health insurance. And it's 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 so overwhelming. So I will say 100% to what you said, get that in line first. Talk to HR, right? Do all that stuff. You might need, I know I needed my tax accountant to be on board. I needed like other people in my hype team to figure that out. Once I figure that out, I was like, oh, I can do this. I can get divorced now, (laughs) right? So that is a really big step. So I love that you brought in that aspect of it because I think people do get really bogged down, especially with health insurance in this country, to say, what could I do? So if you could just give two sentences about kind of, um, like you said, the 60-day policy, and I know it's obviously different state to state, but like if somebody is like, oh my gosh, how do I do this? What do I do? What would be like, just from a coaching perspective, an action plan that they could take really quick to like figure that out. I think step one is knowing your current coverage is helpful and knowing what you use in your current health insurance so that if you are switching plans, you can make sure you're getting on a plan that's equal or better. And maybe there's a plan that you're on that you're not using all the benefits so you can drop to uh, HSA plan. It depends. And so that step one is understanding where your your insurance is. And then step two is talking with your benefits HR rep, because that is literally their job to know all that information of the health care and health insurance and the process inside and out. So you don't have to be an expert on it. You can go to them and say, this is happening. What do I need to know? And then ha- open up a conversation with them because it is different state by state. Some You can do like 36 months, I think, after a divorce, especially if you have kids, you can stay on. But the IRS gives you 60 days outside of open enrollment after a a significant life event is what they call it to change insurance. And your health and your employer will walk you through that process of how to actually enroll in a new health care plan. So helpful. I think this is going to take the stress out of for a lot of people to hear this. Um, And then just in terms of like talking to your colleagues and stuff like that, I feel like when I, I mean, I work for myself, but back when I was in an educational environment, you know, there were people around me getting divorced. And I feel like once you start talking about it, more and more people open up about it. Do you experience that just like from a coaching perspective? Like once people are like, oh, yeah, I'm going through a divorce, like other people are like, 
Me too. And then like, you end up finding a supportive environment. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I think sometimes there's a fear of judgment around disclosing a divorce of what that says about me as a person. And like you all talk about, is it's actually can be a very empowering process. And so if there is, you don't have to tell everyone all at once. You can start with one person. And the more you share, oftentimes people feel more connected to share their story because they had the same fears about disclosing. So it can be very much a supportive environment you can find that you didn't know was there. And that's where I say start start slow, start with one. But the more comfortable you are with sharing, you're going to find people that are wanting to support you and help you through it too. And then just lastly, from a logistical standpoint, would you recommend putting it in an email too, like to your HR, to higher ups and things like that, not just saying something to them? Like what would you recommend for a client? I think, you can put it in email, especially if you're reaching out to HR and benefits and having that just track record. The email trail I always think is important in the workplace, especially if you have a, a bad manager or mm -hmm. not a great supportive yeah. environment. Yeah. So you can say, hey, I disclosed this. I had this conversation. Then you summarize the conversation, send it in an email. So if for some reason you get reprimanded for performance or X, Y, and Z, you have the track record that says, I've disclosed this. I've been yeah. very open. And you can share that with HR. So that's usually what I say I email yeah. is good for is just for your own self-protection. But HR, it's always helpful for HR so that you have, yeah. if they switch you to a different rep, then they have the the record of, of what you've shared or what you've talked about. And then just to put you on the spot, because this is what you love to do. If somebody is going through this and they find themselves not in a great position and the job is not working with their custody agreement or with whatever, how can you help them pivot with purpose? Oh, I think that is a wonderful question. The biggest thing is this is an opportunity and I really maybe it's opportunity is not the best word, but it is an opportunity for you to get really clear on what it is that matters to you, what you want to do, your values. And from there, you get to decide how and when you pivot. And so working with a coach and someone through that, they're helping you identify that. They're helping you build that trust maybe back up within yourself, that confidence. And then from there, you can make decisions and pivots and changes from a very empowered, confident place. And so that's where I say you have support and you have it within you. And it's okay to ask for support and accountability. In fact, I encourage it because we can't do this alone. I love that. And definitely reach out if you want to pivot with purpose because you are amazing at helping people do that. Thank you so much. This was really helpful. And I think it's going to actually, like, like I said, ease a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. So I appreciate you sharing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Nikki Innocent. I'm a career coach who focuses on authenticity at work and how we lead and how we live our lives. Okay, Nikki, we have a question for you today. It goes like this. We get this question a lot. Hi, Fresh Starts. I'm considering a divorce, but one of the questions that keeps making me very nervous is, can I negotiate changes to my work schedule or my location to accommodate some of my new family arrangements. And I was actually just talking about this with a, one of our divorce coaches who mm. has a client who is a dad who um, travels all the time for work, but now he's going through divorce and he would like to spend more time with his kids. So this comes up a lot. So what do you say, Nikki? How would you work with a client, you know, when this comes up? Well, I think that, you know, knowing that, I mean, if it were a client, I'd probably know a little bit more about their background and the organization that they're at. But I, I really think that there's a multi-prong approach to this. I think oftentimes you're like, easy button answer. Here's the one thing I say and magically unlocks all of the, the stuckness. Um, but I think there's there's a few ways you go about it. I think you initially can take a look at uh, your HR packet to understand what the actual benefits in place are. So often we get that paperwork in the beginning of a work place, uh, our work, our time in our job, and we sign it. And we're like, yeah, yeah, cool, cool, cool. What am I doing? What's my comp? And uh, a lot of times the the actual benefits of that we don't notice, nor do we even think about until we potentially need them. And oftentimes when we talk about things like divorce that is like a personal thing and not necessarily a professional thing in the traditional ways, we forget that like there are 
there are ways that we can be supported in our personal lives. And there is no way, at least the way that I believe, if we're going to be living and leading authentically to separate your personal and professional self, when you come into the workplace, you're bringing whatever was happening outside inside. And organizations are getting more and more savvy to that, even if policies, procedure, and language isn't always kind of meeting you exactly where you are in your crisis of a divorce situation. Um, There are ways that you can creatively approach that kind of benefits package, whether it be some version of a wellness stipend, or if there's some sort of element of your health insurance that covers therapy or covers some sort of mediation or some sort of just support for you as a person, but also navigating the dynamics of the emotional um, and psychological parts of this that I think are really challenging And usually are the things that stop us from feeling like we can bring this to work because usually at work, I need to be like buttoned up and know all the answers. But in reality, when something breaks, it can be really challenging to acknowledge that and still feel confident in who you are as a professional self. Um, So, yeah, I think there's kind of the health insurance part. There's also something that a lot of people don't tend to use that are called EAPs. either emergency assistance programs or employee assistance programs, depending on where you are. And sometimes in those, um, there is a kind of real uh, short-term solution. So if you're like, I don't want to have to go through this months-long process to try to find help, there is like a number you call and someone can help you. And so it might not be a forever and always support, but it's something to diffuse in the moment. I also think that talking to someone that you trust at work, letting them know that something is going on, um, that might not be your boss, that might be your boss, that might not be somebody on your direct team, but having that like pressure released a little bit that you're not just like holding it and holding it and becoming a pressure cooker or a balloon that's about to burst at work is really important. Knowing and honoring, you don't want to just be dumping on that person that you trust because it creates kind of an imbalance, but ensuring that you're not struggling by yourself in a way that when things start falling, because we are human beings and we're not meant to do and be all things, even though, you know, that was (laughs) growing up for many of us in the millennial generation, we were supposed to like put our mind to it and we could do it all and be it all. That's not reality, especially when something so important as aspects of your family shifting and changing and, and your plans shifting and changing. I think it's really important for us to honor that and having a person um, that knows that I think is important. The other part The coach in me wants to say that if you're working towards a goal, you're 95% more likely to achieve that goal or move towards it if you tell somebody about it and you have a timeline that has been spoken out loud. And so if you use that same energy with regard to the person that you trust and just kind of sharing what's going on, it's really important. Um, And then the last part, this is kind of a little bit of that, like, I like to do these exercises, but they trick our minds a little bit. The beauty of you sharing it out loud is that you actually get to witness yourself saying the things. You get to witness the processing that's been bouncing around all in your head come out of your mouth and you hear it in the same way that the person listening to you is hearing it. And there is something so beautiful about one, the reflection opportunity that comes there, but also the ability to ask yourself, like, is that really what I mean? Or, ooh, that came out wrong. And having that not be coming out either in a mediation or a divorce situation the first time or with your boss the first time that it might have just come out like, oh my God, I've played this in my head that there's a lot of emotions that are coming out as I say this. Um, So giving yourself that. And then finally, if the person you trust isn't your boss, uh, really coming up with a strategy on how to talk to your boss about it. And I usually talk about it in this way, like give yourself permission to kind of paint a picture or make a case. I come from a background in management consulting and, and private equity where there's a lot of business cases and pitches and all that kind of stuff. So think of this as, okay, there's an emotional part of it, but what am I trying to communicate to my boss and what am I trying to get out of it? What is the benefit for both of us? And so if it's something like I need to change the time that I'm working, I need to minimize my travel or at least adjust my travel schedule, how can I frame that in a way that's showing them like, here is the realistic time frame that we can work with, at least in the moment, because again, with divorce and these types of changes, you're usually going through phases of this. It's not like I know right now how it's going to be for the next six months to a year to two years. You know, divorce is another thing that I think we heard about 50% of marriages end in mm-hmm. divorce, but we never hear about how yeah. long and taxing that process can be. And so really giving yourself permission to have solutions, but adding flexibility to it, adding like, this is a conversation that I'd like to come back to because it is evolving. And I'm sure that our organization's needs will be evolving. I'm sure that my priorities will evolve as well, but I just want to create a space for us to discuss this so that I can show up in the best, most effective way to be a member of this team that is productive, but also in a way that I'm not burning myself out. So you don't have me at all by the end of this. Um, And so I think there's a part of this that we can do Again, I would go through like very, very specific things with a coaching client on this, but I think really 
not feeling like you have to do it all by yourself and you have to do it perfectly because there is no perfect in this. And we don't have the ultimate control. When you have at least one other person in the dynamic of a divorce, making things change, making timelines change, pulling a rug out from under you sometimes, or maybe you would do that yourself. Like yep. there is a whole lot of fluidity and flexibility that's important. So kind of, I think about it, if you're an athlete, before you start playing a sport, you warm up, you stretch, you warm up your muscles. Like before there is some version of a crisis or a, I can't go on the mm-hmm. trips anymore next week, Yeah, really just warm that situation up so people are prepared. Um, and I will add one last piece. I think is part of the fear of this. Like I say all this and you're like, yeah, cool. That sounds great. And also this is scaring me shitless. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Understanding that there are going to be people that the subject of divorce, I talk a lot about this with death and grief and loss as well, will have a, will create a response in them that has nothing to do with you. And so really honoring that, like, there are probably going to be things that are said that might be hurtful, that might be out of left field, that might just be completely non-productive and, kind of greasing your shoulder a little bit for that and letting that roll off because yeah. so often when you talk about something that has been seen as taboo, people have these fear responses or they're trying to protect you. Or I always think about like your parents when something bad happens and they say the exact wrong thing, it's because mm-hmm. they're afraid of something and they want it to stop for you, but they didn't mean to harm you, but it happened so fast yeah. and they're in a position of power. So having that kind of preemptive Warm up and greased shoulder will also help so that uh, it can still feel expansive and it can feel like it's moving forward, even if you don't know exactly where that mountaintop is. It's all really it's such good advice. So really what it comes down to is having open communication, oh, right? Yeah. With your, with your, so that being said, would you recommend, like, let's say I am going to file for divorce or I just filed for divorce. Do I shoot my manager an email and say, Hey, this is what's going on. Do I set up a meeting? Like, what would you recommend doing there in that situation? So here's what I would say. I think it, again, I hate the answer of it depends, I, but I really think it, you already have a version of communication with your manager. Right. So, Having that wisdom and knowledge and expertise that me as a talking head on a Mm -hmm. podcast right now doesn't have, really trusting that there are pieces of information that have come and you've gleaned from whether you've been there for five minutes, five years, like you know what the style of communication is when you need to have conversations that might be a little bit either uncomfortable or ambiguous You'll, you'll get a sense of like where your boss does with that type of stuff. There are some bosses that love to be in it with you and want to build it with you. And there are some right. bosses that are like, why are you telling me this unless there's something specific for me to do? And right. so I think really understanding what has worked well, you can use it in a like project specific perspective. If you look back on the most, you know, the most important project of the last year, what was the communication style and preference mm. from your boss? What worked? What didn't? That's um, great. If you do any kind of debriefs after projects, like, thinking about what their feedback was to how your communication style went or Mm. timelines, all that I think is really important. I will say, again, going back to that kind of case study energy, thinking, putting yourself in their shoes as you're having this conversation of like, what are their needs? What are their priorities? What are the things they're looking from me? Mm. And how do I position what I'm telling them so that we are on the same side of the table, that they are going to be a help to me and also We have so many people that love to be asked, especially bosses, that Mm -hmm. love to be asked for their advice, whether they've gone through a divorce or not, really saying, you know, I'm trying to manage my workload. This is happening outside. I'd love your thoughts, advice, any Mm. guidance you can give me so that, again, it feels like they're part of it, invested in the journey with you. Um, Again, there will be... I, I. The reason I left my corporate career to do this work is I know that there are bosses that will respond negatively to Mm -hmm. that kind of approach. And so really, I think having the, I I have a whole podcast about this thing called (laughs) cover your ass energy. Yeah. Um, There will be that kind of response that's like, oh shit, this is a person I rely on. They're not going to be able to be here anymore. How can I cover my ass? Whether I get kind of get cold and hard and tell them they need to do this thing and this is more important than your family or I act like they don't work here anymore. And I start giving everybody else their stuff. It, it kind of lobotomizes the ability for us to yeah. connect. Um, yeah. And so really giving yourself permission to honor what you know about this person. And then I think curiosity and not necessarily feeling like you have to have the answer or they have to have the answer, but allowing it to be normal communication. If you have something like a, a weekly status or a monthly check-in or something right. along those lines, especially if it's not heat of the moment, I need to address this because right. I can't be in work tomorrow. 
trying to build that in. Um, I usually encourage, especially if it's something that is emotional to do that in the front end, Mm -hmm. um, tell the person ahead of time, you know, I have something a little bit bigger picture that I want to talk to you about before we dive in, if you don't mind. Um, and you could say that ahead of time if it's a person that doesn't do well with surprise. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you're kind of already setting the stage of like, all right, we're right. co-collaborating on a solution right. together. I love that. Laying the groundwork and then the co-collaborating kind of inviting them in, which is a little tricky to do sometimes during divorce, but maybe beneficial in the long run and when yeah. it's a workplace situation. No, that's all yeah. super, super good advice. Um you know, I think it's hard no matter which way you spin it because divorce, like you said, is unpredictable. So I really, I love this idea of like kind of breadcrumbing the business a little bit and saying like, this thing's happening. I might have to do this and reminding them probably it's not going to last forever. It's just for right now. Um, And then what do you do if like you get a really negative response from your boss or your manager? Like how do you cope with that? Do you just come to Nikki and find a new job or what do you do? <laughs> well, I, I, my, oh, I, okay. There's a couple of things that have come to my mind. This is that. I'll tell you, this is not a divorce story, but this is a story of a boss of mine that reacted in the complete terrible way. I was talking about um, a salary negotiation and the response that I got after, again, I did all the things I'm talking about, right? I, I think communication about challenging yeah. things tends to have a similar thing. The response was, who do you think you are and where do you come from? Oh Which no! Has its own. <laughs> there's, some Yikes. there's a whole lot of systemic. Yeah, that's not about you at all, right? actually. Right. Yeah, right. But and also that person is standing in the way of that approval, right? So while I say grease it and let it off your shoulder, if you're like, wait, but what am I doing next? Or am I doing still have a job? Like, it's nice to be able to like emotionally let that off, but like, how is that stopping my my ability to do the work that I do? So I think there is a part of this that giving yourself the opportunity to like, I guess, track, document what is said, write that note for yourself so you have it. And if it really did not go well for you in that moment, um, allowing yourself to kind of come back to the table when things have diffused a little bit and say, you know, I know we had this conversation, didn't seem to go as well as I wanted, but I really want to make sure we're on the same page moving forward. Mm. Can I? Here's what I heard. Is that what you heard? Not yeah. trying to kind of double down in the conversation. Um, the other thing just to add to the mix, and I'll maybe, maybe I'll say take the notes immediately and then come back a few days later and take the notes again. Because yeah. I don't know if you've heard of Brene Brown talks a lot about a vulnerability hangover. Like yeah. that is going to happen. No matter what, you're going to feel like, yeah. You accidentally walked into work without your clothes on. You're going to feel like yeah. awkward. You're going to feel sick to your stomach, probably, yeah. even if it went amazingly. But if it went poorly, you're well, going to feel like divorce in itself is invasive. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And how do you give yourself permission to see them as separate things for you to tackle on your to-do list and right. also understanding that they're part of a holistic picture? And so right. processing them rather than, again, adding them as another thing in the pressure cooker is a big part of that. Um, and you know, if that isn't a thing, cause again, <laughs> toxic work environments produce toxic boss dynamics. Mm. If it is a situation where you're like, well, there's no fucking way I can go back to that person. Yeah. Really seeing if there's a way to either talk to HR, talk to other members of your team, see if they might be able to collaboratively find a way to have coverage or support. Mm. You know, I know I, I dated a guy recently who had like a very specific, it was later stages of his divorce, but he had a very specific um, schedule that was happening. And it was like, all right, cool. So we have this schedule we've been going with the whole time I've been here, but like I have my kids on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So how can we adjust? You take, it's kind of like coverage at a restaurant. Like you take these hours, I'll take these hours. And if your boss cannot do that, trying to find a way within your team to support each other, as Mm. again, a lot of people don't like talking about work as a family, but like as a whole bunch of people trying to work towards a goal together. And if HR is an option, great. If sometimes this is a hard thing too, if it's leapfrogging your boss to the person above your boss, that might also be a way to do it. Again, mm. I work with a lot of people on the script on how to do it. And uh, I was going to say that. Yeah. Them, so but- if, if somebody's going through this and they need just the support in terms of that intersection of the workplace and divorce and all that, and the empowerment piece to come talk to you, do some, do some coaching sessions with you, you'll help them figure that out and how to for speak sure. up for themselves. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I have actually a client who is a freaking delight. She, um, she was going through a divorce when we first started working together still. Um, and she actually hopped on a podcast and did a, a blog post about how to be an amicable dynamics with your spouse 
during a divorce. And it was not something that was just uh, so many of the things that we talk about and so much mm. of the way that I do the work I do is like it cross pollinates. Yeah, so it does. One element of your life is going to fortify you in another. And so yep. rather than feeling like, oh, this is another thing I yeah. have to do, yeah. it's all contributing to your sense of foundational stability when the world feels like it's cracking underneath your feet. I love it. I love it. All such great advice. And reach out to Nikki if you want that support because she will help you find the words to say. So thank you so much, Nikki. That was awesome. Thank you for listening to today's story. We're always here and we're so proud of you. A Fresh Story is produced by Fresh Starts Registry the first and only platform for everything you need to begin again. You can read the show notes and learn more about today's episode at afreshstory.com.